Hi everyone, I'm Amir Banarse. I'm part of the Pivotal Field team, focusing on data solutions on top of the platform. And today I'll be presenting with Karthik. I'll let him introduce in a bit. But the topic of the conversation today is about how to build this planet scale apps that is globally distributed transactional applications using a globally distributed database. And what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna walk you through how we build this app, which has about hundreds of millions of products actually 100 plus million products, and reviews, and ratings, and Spark pipelines, whole bunch of things deployed on top of PCF. So that's PAS and PKS only, no external entity. So with that, just a quick introduction. Uh, I'm Eben Arce, part of the platform team. I went to UPenn. I used to be a customer of Pivotal before I came to Pivotal, wherein I worked on Cassandra using a bunch of Netflix tools on uh, on a basically a regulatory agency platform. That is, we used to monitor and regulate about 70 different stock exchanges in US, with most of it running on HBase and Cassandra. And back then, I never knew who developed Cassandra, so I'll let Karthik speak for himself now. <laughs> hey, guys. Uh, I'm Karthik. I'm one of the co-founders and the CTO at uh, Yugabyte. Uh, I mean, we'll talk a, little, a lot more about Yugabyte in a bit. But before that, um, I was at Nutanix, building the distributed uh, storage system. And before that, at Facebook. We're going to talk a little bit about like, what we observed at Facebook and the journey in a little bit of depth. But just wanted to say I, I've had the privilege of working with uh, and building Cassandra and HBase at Facebook for some massive applications. These are all uh, consistent, transactional, uh, geo-distributed applications and things you might be very familiar with, like Facebook's Messenger product, where people send messages to each other. Yeah. Uh, Facebook's own internal uh, alerting and metric tracking monitoring tool uh, called ODS. And, and these were massive applications. Facebook Messenger, for example, had an ingest rate of 20 billion messages a day. And uh, we got HBase into production for it, which stored the messages, the search index, the threading info, so on and so forth. And ODS did over a trillion data points a day. So, and these are things we're just going to talk about in detail. Right. You can get started. I'll yeah, do the can get started. Okay, yeah. sound good. Yeah. So, uh, so as promised, what is Yugabyte, right? Like in the simplest possible manner, you can think of Yugabyte as a SQL plus NoSQL database that's built for a cloud native world, okay? So all the arguments about should I use SQL, should I use NoSQL for every single feature, we're trying to get rid of that. I mean, you still have the VI versus Emacs fights, you can still continue to have those, but at least, you know, SQL, NoSQL, you can put that to rest, so yeah. Um, so another way of looking at Yugabyte is it's a transactional high-performance database for building planet-scale apps. So three operative words in there at the core. Yugabyte is transactional. It can give you very high performance, and it's good for planet-scale. So planet-scale could mean just scaling out in a single zone of a single region or scaling out across different geographies in the globe. So they both refer to building cloud-style applications. All right. So... First, before we go into uh, what is Yugabyte and how it helps and all of more, more details, I just wanted to talk you guys through how this transformation happened at Facebook. So whatever we're going through here is something that was not new, at least to a bunch of folks like us at Yugabyte who had been through this journey at Facebook. So um, let's see how it started. So I joined Facebook around 2007. Uh, there were about 30 million people on the site when I joined. And I remember thinking like, you know what, how much more is the site going to grow anyway? I mean, there's already 30 million users, right? Like, couldn't have been more wrong because uh, over, the, yeah, go for it, yeah. over the next couple of years, it turned out that we were uh, well on track to hit a billion users. So a lot of growth left, and a lot of growth brings a lot of technical challenges, right? So, so the real questions over the next couple of years were, how do we scale to a billion users? First question. And second question, how do we survive the week? Because the, the, we were like just using a cache and a database, and, and the apps were written to be aware of every piece of SQL, no SQL, multi-data center. Every few months, you'd have to rewrite the app to really understand how to page data across these different tiers and so on and so forth. So it was really an effort throwing hardware at the problem and keeping it up and running. So we split the company into two pieces. One piece was keep the lights running, and the second piece was Let's make sure that two years from now, we're not doing the same thing. We can, we can at least go and build more apps, right? So, and if you think about it, this is, is, is the essence of digital transformation. You want to build more digital apps. So what happens at a billion users? Well, what you find is you have a lot of data. In Facebook's case, there were petabytes of data coming through. You have billions of IOPS. So that means you can't be saying, sorry, I, my cluster is only rated for this much, these many IOPS max. I can't, 
your, your app is successful, well, that's great for you, but I can't deal with this or I can't do it. So it's, you don't want to be beaten by your own success. Uh, you need to scale out frequently because the previous two statements pretty much imply scaling is a part of life. You have to be able to add machines anytime and scale out. And finally, you have to focus on zero downtime because the 12 a.m. tonight for three hours, we'll have the cluster down to do some upgrades. That doesn't fly because there are so many clusters and so many machines that you'd be having downtime all the time. Right? So, so these are some of the core requirements. Now, at the macro scale of things, these were the changes that happened inside Facebook. Right? So firstly, we reorganized ourselves into globally distributed data centers. So instead of just writing to one data center, you needed to have masters taking rights in multiple data centers. We reorganized ourselves into nearby data centers so that if an operator tripped over a cable and took down 100 machines, you still have another nearby data center that could serve reads. And, and that's not hypothetical. That has actually happened with us. But anyway, so this is what we know today as zones. The next thing is containers for deploying applications. I've had one of my buddies at, at Yugabyte when he, when he was in Facebook, had a problem he had to debug, wrote some test code that referenced his account and left that machine. And after a while, it got added into the production tier. And suddenly, he's finding he's getting 10,000 user friend requests a minute. And his friend request is going over the roof. And it so happened this machine got recycled. And this was in the pre-cloud native era. So you need to be able to make sure that stale code, stale machines don't make their way into production. right? And when you have a large fleet of machines, that's a non-trivial problem. So we built our own container ecosystem. Today, that's known as Kubernetes in the outside world, but we have something, we had something back then called Tupperware. I'm sure it has progressed a whole lot and might even have a different name today. Uh, the third thing was to make everything microservices based, so you don't have to reason through the app in a central team. We had central teams rewriting the application tier on, like, preventing problems like what we called a thundering herd. For example, you have a 10,000 web servers that are trying to read from the cache. The data is not in the cache. What would the, what would the app logic do? It would say, go to the database, read the data, and populate it in the cache except if 10,000 web servers go hit the database at the same time, that database is going to die. Now the, the slave gets promoted, except the caches don't still have the data. So 10,000 servers now hit the slave, and that's gone too. So basically, you're not serving data. So you might as well have not written the data, which would have served you much easier in the first place. Right? But these are complex problems. So you have to now have 10,000 guys hit, lock everybody out, one guy do the fetch and populate, then have a distributed cache that's consistent and serve. These are hard problems in the app tier, and it'll take you many months to get through these simply because you wanted to add a simple feature in the UI, right? Like, I mean, how hard is that? Um, okay, so the final stage of our transformation was the data tier. Turns out the data tier is actually ridiculously hard to transform because it has data and it has APIs and people want those to continue to work, right? So one of the things that we did at Facebook, and this is not unique to Facebook, this is what the big tech companies do anyway, like Uber, Pinterest, et cetera. We built a system called Tau. Um, but anyway, so the deal was we told our application developers, you get a new set of APIs that you program to. These APIs will abstract you away from the database layer, the database tier, and it's going to give you transactions, performance, and scale. Like whether you're writing to a different data center, whether it's cross data center replicated, you don't have to bother. The APIs are going to encode the contract inside and you will get those contracts and SLAs met and you don't have to deal with how do I move it across this tier? Am I dealing with a write through cache? Do I deal with this thundering herd? Don't deal with all of this stuff. Just make sure you express what you want through those APIs. But unfortunately for the enterprise, there's no general platform, firstly, right? And yeah, maybe we just go to the so what, yeah. So yeah, let's, yeah. So all of these are, all of this is great and all, and yeah, billions and petabytes and all, but, but is that really the problem that all the enterprises are facing? Is that really something that I'm hitting today? I mean, you guys are all probably already thinking that, right? So it may not be billions of IOPS, but it definitely is millions of IOPS, and it's something that you would grow to become, right? So over time, you would notice that the number of apps you put out, you have to deal with billions of IOPS. Um, you don't have tens of applications like Facebook with massive footprint on what they do. You have thousands of applications, though, that do a little bit, right? And each one has a different workload because enterprise apps are more diverse. And nobody wants a custom API. Nobody wants a mandate to say, throw away every single piece of code, library, ORM, whatever you have, and you have to write it to a new system. That doesn't really cut it in the enterprise world because there are so many developers familiar with so many frameworks. So where do you go from there? Now, that's where I wanted to draw some analogy to what Pivotal does and what we are doing at Yugabyte, right? So with Pivotal, like, you notice that, I mean, the world has been progressing in this direction anyway from corporate data centers 
the, most of the guys had one data center, the lucky guys had two, and the real, really big guys had maybe three, right? That was about the lay of the world even five years ago. Today, you have over 100 different data centers in different regions across different clouds, right? And your customers don't really care if you want to use them or not, because if the next guy uses them, they're going to switch the service, right? That's, that's the reality of the competitive world we live in. Now, the second thing is you had traditional servers, and it's okay to take three hours downtime to upgrade stuff, but increasingly, agility has become important. So the transformation to going to VMs and to containers have, is here. So that is happening, right? And then thirdly, like don't build apps in, the, in a monolithic fashion. Think microservices. Microservices might actually introduce a little bit of inefficiency, but it gives you a lot of win on agility and time to market. So, what is all of this about, right? It's really about making the, the app build faster. Time to market on features, developer agility, right? That's really what all of this is, is about. Okay, so let's talk about the data tier now, right? So you have a bunch of databases. I mean, I know some of these databases are relatively newer, but they're still legacy when it comes to the container world because they were all built in an on-prem era. Right? Every one of these databases started getting built when cloud was not a thing, containers were not a thing. So is it enough to just take these databases, put them into a container like containerized ecosystem like Kubernetes, and say, I'm now cloud native. Am I done? Like, let's take a look, right? So, so if you try to use existing databases inside Kubernetes, right? Like, I just wanted to take you through the three operative words we've been talking about over and over. Performance, transactions, and scale, right? If you take a look at the bottom left, you have, uh, yeah, that shows weird here, but it shows a little differently here, but anyway. So bottom left is your RDBMSs. RDBMSs are, have good performance. They offer you transactions, and we'll look at why you need any of these, but they offer you good performance and transactions, but they don't scale out. So the minute you have exhausted a node's worth and you have to add a next node, it's about nine months of redo minimum on your app tier because your app fundamentally has to give up a lot of things and understand sharding and scaling. Okay? So the top left was then brought about. It's the NoSQL tier, right? So the NoSQL dealt with planet scale and it gives you performance, but it doesn't give you transactions. So things you're used to like atomically updating multiple keys or doing a secondary index and reading the value by the index, those are things you will forego when you use the top left, right? Now, you still need those, so effectively the world ended up moving some pieces of data to the top left and the others to the RDBMS at the bottom left, but then came something like Spanner where they said like, hey, the bottom left is still a problem. You need to scale out. Like if you need to scale out your transactions because your OLTP data is growing, you can use something like a Spanner, right? But there's really no choice for like, the, like a, a cloud agnostic on-premise way of deploying this. And nevertheless, you still need to use it in conjunction with a NoSQL database, or at least one NoSQL database. So, so with Yugabyte, what we're saying is we're bringing the three aspects together. So on one table, you can have spanner-like distributed global consistent transactions. And on, another, an, on another table, you can do like event-style data with, say, a JSON data type so that you're able to deal with a lot of data deluge, right? Like you're able to deal with high-density data. Um, yeah. So, so, so effectively, um, I think the, the, the point I was trying to make is that just moving a database into a container doesn't really truly make it cloud native because when the time comes, you will be able to. So what, was, what is so different about containers compared to what you used to do like 10 years ago, right? You wanted machines, you'll get machines, but you'll get them in about eight months, right? So you got about six months to rewrite your app. And, or, or like if you got it in eight months, you have seven months to rewrite your app and you're not the slowest person, you're fine, right? Except today with containers and the cloud IaaS, you'll get it in like seven minutes, right? Or eight minutes. So it still takes you six months minimum to rewrite the app and, and that's not a cloud native way, right? And you're rewriting the entire app because the infrastructure doesn't hold, not because your app takes eight months to write, right? So, so that's where like Yugabyte and a containerized ecosystem, a very dynamic ecosystem is a really good combo for simplifying app development. Okay, so this brings us to what does Yugabyte do? So we talked about a lot of this stuff. So Yugabyte is cloud native, so it runs in, uh, as well in containers as it does in VMs and bare metal. So it can run on any IaaS, it has no external dependencies. It's self-healing and, healing and fault tolerant. That's kind of table stakes for anything that's cloud native these days. Uh, it's planet scale, so it, it understands geographic distribution of data, and you can deploy it in a variety of different ways where you have low write latency, low read latency, global consistency, et cetera, et cetera. Automatically shards and rebalances itself, so just add nodes and it's gonna scale out and use the power of all those nodes. 
Um, it, cont it does distributed asset transactions when you need them, just like Google Spanner. And uh, at the core, it's a transactional key to document storage engine. And uh, finally, it has high performance, both in terms of low latency and high throughput reads and writes, so ingest and doing like Spark-like jobs. And uh, it's open source. It's an Apache 2.0 open source at the core. And uh, it's doubly open source in the sense we, when people say, hey, there's a lot of databases. Why are you building another database? We really think people mean there's a lot of database APIs. Don't make me learn another API. So that's yeah. what we did. We decided to extend, implement and extend existing APIs. So you interact with Yugabyte using known APIs, the Cassandra query language, the Redis language, and we're working on Postgres. So nothing new to learn, but everything new at the bottom that will help you just pick APIs and not worry about scaling out SQL or like getting transactions into a Cassandra language or persisting Redis. OK, so I think this thing pretty much said what I, what I, like summarizes what I just said on the previous slide. So we bring the best of SQL and NoSQL into one database. So features on the left, like uh, secondary indexes, asset transactions, or a way to do a, like an expressive query language, like I want to have a unique constraint on a column, for example. All of these are RDBMS constructs. Things on the right, like where you can read from the nearest data center, uh, optimize it to really scale out for massive amounts of write, in an, like for example, an IoT or a stock code style workload, or uh, doing TTL-based expiry, being able to tolerate faults are no SQL characteristics, and Yugabyte blends both into a single database. Uh, another way to think about it is if you think of Cosmos DB, which is a multi-model database that's oriented towards NoSQL, and if you think of Spanner, which is a SQL database, transactional database, oriented towards scale-out SQL, uh, Yugabyte is, co combines the best of the two into one database, so it gives you multi-model and high performance with asset transactions and global consistency. Okay. Uh, by the way, guys, please feel free to ask questions. Like, yeah. if you, like, uh, but, okay. So. Through the architecture, we're actually going to look at this demo app that we have shown on the left, which has this architecture. But this is an example of a globally distributed deployment of Yugabyte. As far away as you can think, like there's uh, one copy of data in US West, one copy of data in US East, and one copy of data in Tokyo. And it's a real running app. Writes happen from all data centers. They maintain global consistency. And reads can happen either from the source of truth or from the nearest data center. So that eliminates your need. Yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great question. So question is, how is consistency achieved across such a globally distributed setup? Um, on the right here, the second point talks about raft-based consensus. So every table you create is split up into small chunks, shards. We call them tablets. Each of these tablets have replicas. These, the replication across these tablets happens using raft. Raft replication protocol. And Raft replication ensures that there is a global consistency across these different nodes at a per shard or per key level. And we have a global transaction manager to make sure that there is cross key consistency. All right. OK, so um, uh, thank, you. thank you for the question. Please feel free to keep asking, guys. Uh, uh, the second thing was uh, the storage on each node. Uh, we call it a DocDB. It is a heavily optimized version of RocksDB. We've made a lot of enhancements to it. We've written about it, but happy to talk to you guys about what changes we made to make it efficient. But effectively, it is the, the changes really make it highly performant when you come in through the different APIs that we support on top. Right? And we talked about global transactions for maintaining cross-key consistency when you do multi-key operations. And finally, we have a pluggable query layer that we support currently have uh, Cassandra and Redis in production used by many customers. And uh, we are working on Postgres that's coming out in just a few months' time. OK. Um, is another way to look at the, the architecture. So you can interact with Yugabyte using Cassandra, Redis, and Postgres APIs. We have actually, it's wire compatible with these APIs, so you can just use open source client drivers. But we have enhanced these APIs. So for example, with Cassandra, you can do transactions and strongly consistent and efficient secondary indexes. With Redis, you get scalability and persistence out of the box, along with follower reads. And with Postgres, you get all of the Postgres functionality with scale out beneath it. Right? So, and uh, so that's what the second thing says. It says there's automatic uh, load balance automatic sharding and load balancing built irrespective of the API you come through. And at the core, you have Raft-based replication, a DocDB-based storage, and a global transaction manager that ties together a bunch of IaaS units, whether they're containers, VMs, or bare metal machines. Right? And uh, it runs on any IaaS. And to the right, because of our choices of being API compatible, what you find is that 
it's, it really works with a wide array of ecosystems that you're already familiar with. So Spring Data, Kafka, Spark, Presto, Janus Graph, to mention a few. We're working with uh, our, uh, and trying to get out Yugabyte, uh, Spring Data Yugabyte connectors so that you can really exploit you know, transactions in a Cassandra-like language or secondary indexes in a Cassandra-like language. Questions? Oh, thanks. Yeah, please. Um, I think the plans are definitely there. It's something that we just have to investigate. So definitely, yes. And yeah, yeah go ahead. I'm sorry? Yes, absolutely. It runs on Kubernetes. Uh, uh, there's That's, a Docker. Yeah. That, uh, it's, <laughs> the IaaS unit, I guess, is Docker. But yeah, it runs on Kubernetes. In fact, uh, like we are like in a bunch of POCs with uh, Pivotal on PKS. Uh, so it's, it definitely runs on Kubernetes, yes. Cool. That actually brings us to the next slide is, how do you deploy this on PKS, right? And a quick history here is that we've been working with Yugabyte team for about six months now. Once James Waters and Ian Andrews introduced us to them, we had a look at what Yugabyte offers, and they started putting together the integrations of how to get this running on PKS. So PKS itself is about six to eight months old at this point. So they were really one of the early adopters of trying to get into the ecosystem. To that point, Anyone who has ever worked with any Kubernetes, not just PKS, understands the pain point of how to deal with YAML, load balancers, PVCs, what happens if pods disappear, how do you recover from the storage, right? So what Yugabyte team did was, and we'll, we'll talk to Chris in the demo as well, is they have a single pain to go and manage all of their clusters. And their clusters are rightly so-called universes, because obviously they span across the globe, no, not interplanetary yet, but still the globe. <laughs> and to get this universe concept inside Kubernetes, their core goal was to make sure that everything is doable through the, the same user experience that Pivotal developers have. That is, a typical day in the life of a Pivotal developer is logging on to the CFCLI or getting into the Apps Manager. So give me one minute. Okay. So as a developer, I go and log into the Apps Manager. What Yugabyte team did was they built a service broker first. So if you see at the very bottom of the screen, there's Yugabyte, which exposes a bunch of these plans that you can choose as a t-shirt sizing to go and deploy this, P this Yugabyte cluster on PKS. On the other side, all you need to do is, once you bootstrap your PKS cluster, so PKS is an on-demand Kubernetes, provision via Bosch for the folks who haven't used PKS. Once your PKS cluster is ready, there's a simple command to go and deploy something called as Yugabyte console, or they call it the Yugaware console, which is where you'll see this globe, and you'll see which all providers are now available for you today. So as of today, the PKS, Pivotal PKS integration with Yugabyte uses a single zone, or like single region with multi-zones inside it. So first thing you do is you go create the cluster, you take your service key and, or kubeconfig and go and upload it to, to your Yugaware console. From that point onwards, as an app developer, without having access to Yugaware, because Yugaware is mostly meant towards the operators. So as an app developer, I go in and select, okay, extra small, and let's say I call this as S1P PKS demo. I need to call it a universe name. And I'll tell you the reason why this is done. OK. As soon as I hit Create here, I want to quickly go and touch upon kubectl on my cluster. So this is my kubectl. I do get all, all namespaces. You'll see there is only yugaware UI, which is the UI endpoint that I'm hitting. No other pods, no other services running. I go and click on Create. At this point onwards, my service broker accepted the request. That is, it's now going and provisioning an on-demand service. So I go back here, quickly click on Refresh, the universes. I see the S1P PKS demo coming up. At this point, you can take a quick look at the meter up there, progress bar, sorry, which is going to go and quickly provision your bunch of nodes. So Yugabyte, as Karthik had mentioned, it uses master and a T server, or tablet server topology. So at first, the master pod comes in, they form a stateful set. Then the T server comes in, they form a stateful set. For a small, extra small plan that I provision, we have a fixed number of three masters and three T servers that happen. Now we can go back to the console and quick, take a quick look at what's happening on my cluster. 
So we see a bunch of new pods and services are now coming up. Okay, they are running 45 seconds ago. So this is good. And some new load balancers are popping up. So we'll give it like 30 more seconds, let the progress bar finish to 100%, and we'll go back to Apps Manager at that moment. Until then, we can take a quick look at what does YougaWare actually do for you. So you can think of YougaWare as similar to Ops Manager. That's part of PAS. That is, in YougaWare, I can go and take a quick look at how my nodes are performing or where my clusters have been deployed. Uh, let me just do one quick refresh. And then get quick metrics of what is happening inside my cluster. So the whole history that Karthik just mentioned, YougaWare team took care of integrating Prometheus inside every single of these pods. And YouGovern itself acts as this Prometheus monitoring tool, which gives you about 50 different on metrics of what is happening in your cluster. Like every single damn metric that you would think of is in, as part of this. You can also do some tasks that, you know, backups, health checks, things like that. You can actually back it up to a S3 blob store or object store of choice on demand. So now that our universe is ready, again, a typical day in a life of a developer who uses PAS is, once they provision a service, the next step is click on the service that you provision, go create a service key, which is where you'll get the connectivity information and credentials of how to use the service that you just provisioned. Because the operator is not, not going to send you an email or a text message saying that, hey, this is your IP, right? So as simple as it is, I just say S1P dev key. This gets created. Take a quick look at it. It gives me two endpoints today. PostgreSQL, as Karthik mentioned, is in the works, so we haven't exposed it as part of this integration. But you get a Cassandra load balancer, which was on demand spun up on your Kubernetes cluster, and a Redis endpoint with 6379 as support. You take these, and you can do your apps binding as part of, like, just take these and bind it to your apps. And that's the other part of the demo that we're going to be doing so far. So, does that answer your question of if it runs on Kubernetes or not? <laughs> Perfect. So there's a quick bit.ly link of the entire video or the demonstration I did. If you do bit.ly slash yugabyte on PKS, you'll see the exact demo again. OK. So now let's switch gears. We looked at what yugabyte is, how it evolved, how it runs on PKS. So that's a checkbox. It's done. Now let's come to the real world. Spinning up a new cluster on demand in a demo, it's always the simplest thing. Although you pray to demo gods so that it works, it actually worked in this case, so we call it a done. Now, let's look at how exactly you can use these technologies to benefit real-world applications and architectures and use cases. So to that end, we about two years ago, we collaborated with a professor at Stanford who was doing research on recommendation systems. And we got hold of this data set, which basically has millions and millions of products inside it and ratings and reviews and a bunch of metadata around these products itself. So we decided, let's use this data set and build a massive marketplace application. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you actually do this in real world for guys like Etsy and stuff? That's actually what we tried to do, emulate. So in this marketplace, you can go and browse millions of products. You can determine ratings, reviews. We haven't opened up the uh, back end yet to go and write a review. So at this point, you can only rate or check out, check out a review. You can actually buy these products. I hope they get delivered to you, but you can actually buy these products. And last but not the least, having a really seamless user experience. And that's where the whole, whole concept of getting a seamless user experience doesn't depend on your UX developer. It actually depends on how good your database APIs are, how good your data layer itself is to make sure that the user experience is seamless. OK? So quick uh, snapshot on what we are using for the demo. And the last point to be mentioned here is that as and when these news reviews are written, they get directly written into Yugabyte DB in real time, which is running on top of PKS. So let's take a look at the demo that we just spoke about. So as part of the demo, I'll just quickly refresh this because I don't want it to be cached. We call this demo as Kronos Marketplace. And it, it is deployed on top of a Cloud Foundry, so PAS basically uses a bunch of microservices behind the scene. These microservices work in coherence with each other, making sure the data is obviously 
uh, transferred between them, there is no cache involved, and straight away hits Yugabyte DB for all the backend APIs. I think it would be good to mention the stack also, the technical stack, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah. So we decided to call this application or the marketplace as Kronos. That's basically the Greek god of time and consistency. So we wanted to make sure the experience is consistent, the data is consistent. That is, I'll never get a dirty read. That means if the product is not in stock, you cannot buy it. And it's globally distributed. That means if I had multiple of these Cloud Foundry applications running, Cloud Foundry is running, I could deploy the same app which connects to the same backend itself. So it gives me global transactions. So let's take a quick look at the uh, app itself. You basically get to see like you know a bunch of categories. These are the top categories that we curated for this user. Uh, the marketplace itself categorizes the products into 24 different categories. In each of these categories, you can go and take a quick look at the product itself. So I don't know who Curtis Blow is, but then I can buy it for $7.07. I also get to know like what other products that have been bought with this. And this is something that came out of our recommendation systems, which we'll talk about in a bit. So let's do one thing. Let's buy this. Let's buy something that system recommended me, uh, whoever this person is. OK. <laughs> I'm sorry. And then let's buy something. In beauty, let's say, all right, Purology. Yeah, that's definitely useful. Yeah. yeah. OK, so I'm sure our recommendation system is not going to learn why someone bought these products in combination. The beauty product is just to make sure my wife is happy. <laughs> the good thing about our shopping cart, applic uh, the application itself, is there are no taxes. So even though you're in DC or Maryland today, you don't have to pay any taxes. OK. You don't even need a credit card, actually, to be honest. All right. <laughs> so you go, check out. Your order is generated, sent to Yugabyte in the orders table. And uh, you're back to go and browsing and buying more products. Very simple demo, what it does, bunch of millions of products. One quick thing I would like to mention is if you click on any of these categories, you can page in it to whatever you want. This is never ending, because books are probably is like million products inside books, so you can keep clicking on this. So let me do this. OK, now let's get back to how exactly this worked. Like, what exactly was the backend to go build this application, like a real world use case with millions of products inside it? So, from my laptop, I opened up a browser URL, I hit the retail app. Now, retail app, we decided to run it in React. Both of us are not React developers, so, first time, went and tried out React. It took a and long time. It took a long time. And we wanted to simulate a site called etsy.com. Amazon is too old for us. Etsy is a new age millennial thing that we wanted to replicate. So we we're pretty close to the UI. Now, the UI itself hits a bunch of uh, microservices written in Spring Boot. And that's where the core crux and logic of checkout, orders, getting your products itself, and putting them in categories, and a bunch of other things happen. Now, microservices as I mentioned on my PKS slide and the demo itself, they directly connect to Yugabyte, which is deployed right here. And that's what gives me transactions and high consistency and secondary indexes and things like that. Now, how does the data get into Yugabyte? No one asks us this question. So data itself was given to us on an Amazon S3 bucket. Now, all we did was write a simple Spring Cloud streams, so using Spring, Spring Cloud data flow, grab the data, use a Cassandra sync, put it in Yugabyte directly. No special magic. The only thing we changed was the time zones, that is converting UTCs to a bunch of other things for local time zones. Other than that, data is as is getting there. Now, a bunch of things like recommendations, they also bought, bought together, and things like that. Review, ratings, doing some NLP on reviews was done in Spark. So as Karthik mentioned before, Yugabyte offers a straight up Spark connector which comes from Netflix, I believe, in the open source. Yep. And you can just use the Spark connector, do all your analytics, and dump the data in the new, new Yugabyte table. Or you can just upsert or update the current table itself. That is something that will open up again, how we do that. So a couple of things I just wanted to add here, which is that like typically for a marketplace that has millions of reviews and millions of products, you need a NoSQL database, especially if you intend to globally distribute it. right? So yeah. you want it to be able to ingest at a high rate, update at a high rate. Now, if you want transactions, consistency, indexes, you need an RDBMS. And if a single RDBMS doesn't suffice, you have to shard it yourself, which is actually a really complicated problem. right? 
Now the third thing is with something like Spark that does real time, you need to build an ETL pipeline that goes yeah. to yet another type of database and then you run your Spark jobs on there and then you pump back the results of what the recommendations are. And so this diagram looks a lot more complicated if you are doing this with existing. So we're just trying to build a motivation for why we built the database here, right? So it's gonna look a lot more complicated. And the final step is if you wanted this to be low latency for users in Asia, in Europe, and so on and so forth, yeah. you need to distribute this globally with a cache. So you'd see a lot more lines going on back and forth, and each one of those lines is a developer concern and an operator concern. So, yeah. Yeah. So instead of distributing the cache, you're distributing the entire database? That's right. Yes. We're distributing the data, and we're allowing people to read from the nearest data center. So it gives you the consistency of what a cache would expect, which is timeline consistency. Um, and that is more of a NoSQL construct. But we let you still perform globally consistent transactions so your app can talk to any of its local databases without being aware of the topology. And you can change the topology as an operator on the fly with zero downtime on the application side because everything is online, whether you're changing a machine type, changing the geographic zones, or upgrading software. Yep. So, Bobby, great question. What we'll do is we'll switch to another demo where we'll show you a cluster which is globally distributed. Yeah. Currently, as I mentioned before, and Bobby, thanks for the leeway, the current runtimes are these. That means Yugabyte and Spark have been deployed on PKS, which sits in multi-zones, but a single region today, while Spring Cloud Dataflow and Spring Microservices is the best place to basically run them, or PAS itself. So that's our choice of runtimes that we decided for this core architecture. Now, we, did with the, we are done with the demo. We are done with how it actually happened in terms of interaction. Now, let's take some time to dissect the app. So as opposed to building the Hello World app from ground up, what we decided was we'll start with a great app, we'll load a bunch of products, and let's start dissecting the app itself. That plus, is, plus, being the last session of almost the last day, yeah. this is a much easier way when you look at pretty graphics. You know, so where you yeah. <laughs> that was actually the goal. OK, so let's start dissecting the app in terms of why and how we built the app itself, like the categories, the checkout, and things like that. So at this point, we'll turn the talk into a little bit more conversational. So I'm going to ask Karthik pretty hard questions. And he's going to walk us through what design decisions were taken to build the app itself. So Karthik, starting with, how do we categorize the products? Yeah. So yeah, great question. So first thing you see, you go to the home page, you see the top four products in some set of categories, right? Now obviously the set of categories could keep changing. And the set of products that were the best sellers could keep changing because some, a new product could sell more. So effectively, what this represents is a an index, a secondary index, right? So you want to list the top products by sales or by some ranking like metric in each category or a set of categories. So how do we do that? So this is actually uh, the Yugabyte syntax. So what we created was a product ranking table um, that is partitioned by ASIN or the product ID um, in order to be efficient and in order to scale up. So you'll be able to look up and write data very efficiently by product. Now, the next thing we did was to create an index for each of the categories to list data by the top product. So if you look at the index, it has category as the partition key, it has sales rank as the clustering key or the sort key, and it has product ID as the next key after that to form the complete unique primary key. So in order to query the top products, well, if you wanted a specific product, you could yeah. select star from product rankings where ASIN equals a particular product ID, and that's gonna give you all the details for any one product, which is useful when you click through on a product. But uh, if you do a select star from product rankings where category is books, limit 10, offset 20, it's gonna give you the top products the from 20 to 30. So give me 10 products, offset it by 20. It's pretty standard SQL syntax, so it's the third page of top products top effectively, products. right? And uh, give me the, give me the all the products by sorted by uh, you know best selling uh, you know metric in the books category. Right. So Karthik, let me ask you this question. Secondary indexes have been offered by Cassandra and a bunch of other databases as well. So how consistent are your secondary indexes with the source it's data? A, it's a great question. So uh, Yugabyte is like a completely transactional database. So secondary indexes in Yugabyte are built on top of distributed transactions. So what that means is it's a completely atomic write to two different keys. So as a part of the insert, which writes an entry into a product, we will do two inserts under the cover, assuming you have just one index. One insert would go into the products table, which writes the 
details of the product. The second insert internally would go to the index table, which writes the data into the index in a completely consistent way. Now, taking Amay's question on what the rest of the databases offer, if you take RDBMSs, they will offer this functionality, yeah. right? Except they won't scale up. So as your number of activity in your marketplace increases, you will find that more people like are buying products, so you need to update your best sellers more often, and the more you need to do that, you would need to scale out. Now, the minute you scale out your NoSQL database, you can no longer list products by the global set of categories and ranks because, yeah, please, yeah. Yes, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so question was, between Cassandra and Yugabyte reads and writes, which one do you consider is more efficient? Uh, I actually just want to bring up a blog post for this, like if you don't mind, Amit. Yep. Okay. Oh, it's a new Mac, so, yeah. So, Okay, so uh, Yugabyte is, uh, like, we have actually explicitly tested uh, Yugabyte against, okay, apparently we're writing a lot of blogs. So this is a graph of how Yugabyte performs with respect to the YCSB benchmark against Apache Cassandra. Uh, the blue bar is how Apache Cassandra, the latest version, performs. I think it's 3.11 or something. There's, a, there's all the details there. The orange bar is how our performance was in the 0.9 version, which released in December, so way back almost like eight, nine months ago. And the gray bar is our latest release, which is the 1.1 version. As you can see, it performs a lot, lot better, offering you consistency semantics, right? So now the only thing I wanted to stress with what Ame was asking was, with respect to NoSQL databases, Cassandra, Mongo will not offer you strongly consistent global secondary indexes, so no. they just don't have that functionality. So performance immaterial, these are, YCSB, which doesn't do transactional updates, so there are no indexes in this, in this example. This is just simple what Cassandra does and what Yugabyte does comparison, but there are things that Yugabyte does that Cassandra does not do, so we like to think of ourselves as expanding what you can do with a Cassandra language. Okay, so I think the, the short answer to Ame's question was SQL does not scale, but will give you transactions, secondary indexes. <laughs> Cassandra will scale, but will not give you, or Cassandra, Mongo, the NoSQL databases will scale, but not give you secondary indexes. So you need a combination. Yugabyte will scale and will give you secondary indexes. So, yes, please. Yeah. You did. Pipeline. Sync. So, entire. Okay, I just wanted to, entire app is Spring Data Cassandra. Everything and Spring Data Redis, where yeah. I will see ratings and reviews. Are there any plans to have a Spring Data Yugabyte that I don't have to flip between Cassandra and Redis? And yeah, that's exactly, yes, definitely in the plans. One of the conversations we had, I, I think some of the Spring folks Spring, said yeah. they would attend. I'm not sure if they're here, but anyway, that's definitely in the, in, in the plans. Yeah. So. so we, they're going to be incubating the Spring Data Yugabyte module, and then probably it runs as a community module for some time before becoming the part of Spring Data Umbrella. So, question? Yeah, I think yeah, okay, maybe yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. I like it. Database guy. I like it. Database yeah, yeah, yeah. guy. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we'll, 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 yeah. we'll yeah, pull yeah. it up. You know what trade-offs you're making architecturally? You know there's no such thing as a perfect architecture. Yeah, oh, sure. that's a great question. Um, we'll do that at the end because, yeah, I think you're an, a database audience, I'm sure. So, yeah, no, that's great. We'll do that. A little more yeah. of that. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's good, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. And what, and what about, like, you know, say you're, you think that you're using Postgres, right? And what does that mean in terms of the people, the, you know, uh, serialized transactions? 
Great, great, great questions. I see, actually, like, uh, this is awesome. So um, I think I can answer some parts of your question really quickly. Um, as far as uh, our isolation level, uh, we are currently offer snapshot isolation, which is enough for a secondary index use case. It is enough for a lot of use cases that detect write-write conflicts. Uh, serializable isolation is in our roadmap. Serializable isolation detects read-write and write-write both. Um, there is a narrower set of apps that need it, but the performance penalty is usually a bit higher. So our, that hence the choice for what we offer. So that's on one side. Um, as far as uh, whether it's Postgres or, or you know, Cassandra or whatever, the underlying uh, core database is the same. So the type of transactions that get performed are the same. Cassandra and Postgres give you different flavors of how you can model data and query data. So that's primarily the, the only difference. And we will look at a globally consistent single row write. And a multi-row write is like pretty similar. It's just subject to laws of physics in terms of what the latencies are. So the farther apart you are, and your write quorum is, the, li the larger the latency. We also offer read replicas so that you can have low, light ro low write latency, but also a global scale, closer to a cache architecture. Okay, but, but we'll look at that uh, in detail. No, thanks, Varnan. Uh, we, we do have acid transactions, so maybe we'll wait on that. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. Oh, that's, so, awesome. yeah, that's the next part, yeah, so. Okay, perfect, so, yeah, go for it. Karthik, let me ask you this. I bought these products for my wife. It's actually the same ones. You want only one product for your wife. You're not going to like it if you get the other right, two. Yeah. Think, but same anyway. thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, and I clicked on checkout. Yeah. Now, at this point onwards, the checkout itself was similar to XA, but like globally distributed asset transaction. So how do you guys do that behind the scenes? Yeah, great, great question again. So once again, uh, we create an orders table. So uh, the, the architecture is there's an inventory table that tells you how many quantities of the products you have and an orders table that tells you what you have ordered. Uh, typically the rights of the different trans of the different items you buy into the orders table, and the decrement of these items from the inventory table have to be atomic. Otherwise, you get into weird scenarios where you tell people you have stuff and you don't have stuff, or you didn't ship something and they, you just don't even account for it in your inventory. So, so bad things happen if it's not atomic, right? So I think it's a simple way. So first thing is that we need to update inventory and orders uh, atomically. And uh, second thing is that the orders itself can be a flexible schema item, so you can have it as a JSON blob because you may want to keep adding into the orders things like when was it shipped, when was it checkpointed as being sent out, to, when was it fulfilled, when was it shipped, when was it received, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't want a very tight schema, you might want a flexible schema. And the third thing is that on any table, you can enable global transactions with a tag. I think this goes to a part of the question that you had asked, which is what are the trade-offs that we're making in Yugabyte? And you're absolutely right, there are trade-offs always. Um, Yugabyte is a CP database which does high availability. On a failure of any one uh, tablet or node in a quorum, we re-elect a new master in a matter of seconds because we don't have an external dependency on any of, like a zookeeper or an external system to maintain consistency. So that means that uh, we take write availability of a few seconds, uh, and we believe that for most practical applications, that is HA enough, because your app could be disconnected from the application server for a few seconds because of other reasons, so there's no point in looking at it in a microscopic way, right? So kind of doesn't help. So, so we tell people to enable transactions on tables that they want global transactions for, but if you continue to perform single row asset transactions, which is key value updates, or single row updates without cross row transactions, you'll get extremely high performance. If you are doing multi-row updates, it's subject to what you have in terms of your clock skew or your hardware underneath and the RPC distance. So if you have an AWS time sync service, which is an external atomic clock, we can reduce the time. If uh, you have just NTP and the clock is not very tightly synchronized, it's going to give you higher latency. Right? So, okay. So let's, yeah. So in order to do a transaction, and we're just gonna take the simple example of buying two units of some product, a single product, like we'll just stick to the one that he is buying for his wife and skip the <laughs> other two. So uh, you update the product inventory table and decrement the quantity by two for that particular product, and you insert into the orders table something, right? Like the details about his product. And once again, that can just, and you see a JSON snippet there, ID equals something, quantity equals something. You can keep adding more stuff because you might not know what that is, right? So, so this is the way we do it, and this works in Cassandra. So this is just like a Cassandra. Uh, we've done it in a way where um, this just works with the Cassandra CQL protocol. So yep. it's something you can, you can use. Yeah. Okay. You were supposed to do that, well, yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, sorry, I should, uh, <laughs> it's okay, yeah. All right, cool. So the next thing is, we looked at 
So when we look at a single product, right, the fancy beauty product that we browsed, we see ratings and reviews and price, and I get a button for add to cart. So how exactly can I update these ratings in real time whenever yeah. users are giving ratings, as opposed to doing a long database call, yeah. and things like that? And how can I make it more API friendly for developers to just go and add new, such dynamically changing fields? Yeah, absolutely. So, so things like reviews, ratings, page views, et cetera, are highly dynamic, right? So, so you don't need them to be transactional. You need them to be transactional enough. Like you don't want to drop the data and not show anything, but you don't want to incur the penalty of a transaction because this happens in high volume. So Redis sorted sets are a great API in order to achieve this. And you can do something like, on the, it's like it's shown on the left, where you can say, uh, I'm going to add each of these items, and I'm going to keep updating every time somebody writes a review or adds a star. I'm going to update the aggregate number of stars inside a Redis sorted set. The, the value of a Redis sorted set is it's going to keep the product IDs sorted in a descending order, ascending order, whatever you want, by the scores, which is the, the number of reviews. So just a single write every time you hit the product or every time somebody reviews the product, and a single read as shown below, which is give me Z reverse range. So rev range is like give me in reverse order, which is maximum score to lowest score of all products, colon, num reviews, or a particular category, colon, num reviews, and give me starting from zero to one or five or 10, depending on how many you want to show, with scores so I can show the number of stars. And, and that's it, and it's as simple as that, and you can do that with the same database. You don't have to worry about, if you were using traditional Redis, you'd have to worry about where does this data underlying whatever you put into Redis get stored. It has to get stored in a database because if Redis dies, you don't have that data around, right? And if you need to scale out the Redis side of things, how do you do that? It's manual sharding and partitioning. If you want to replicate it asynchronously versus synchronously across geos, how do you do that? So it's just simplifying the way you build apps by treating databases as APIs and the, the core underneath is common. So Karthik, did you just call Redis as a database? That's what I heard? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> point taken. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Going ahead. So once we look at the UI itself and the app itself, I was able to browse through these millions of products that were loaded by category, right? And one of the things that Karthik touched upon was limit and offset. That is, I always show 10 products at a time, and the offset is the only thing that keeps changing. So pagination logic itself in Spring Data Cassandra was like a simple query. So, Karthik, you want to quickly touch on pagination? Yeah. So, one of the things that we have done is like typical Cassandra supports the limit offset, a limit clause, but doesn't support the offset clause. This is something that we have enhanced Cassandra with, so it starts looking closer to a traditional RDBMS. So, these are all like just examples of orienting whatever we are doing towards building online applications or online services. So, with this simple thing, you will be able to now just say, um, you can use prepare bind statements, which are very common in order to achieve better performance. So you just bind different variables for the limit and the offset to change the number of items shown per page and the page number that you're displaying. So it's going to be really easy for you when building an app in order to do that, as opposed to having to read enough, doing the math on how many items to read, how many to filter out, having to transfer all that data back and forth, and, and so on and so forth. Right. So one of the things that I looked up and uh, I was talking to Nikhil, who collaborated with us on this project, yeah. is Typically, Spring Data Cassandra, the queries were done is you grab 100 products and you do client side filtering. That's right. To figure out 10, 1 to 10, 11 to 20, something exactly. like that. Yeah. So we avoided that. That means we actually avoided a RPC database transfer. call or yeah. RPC. Yeah. 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 We, you, you avoided 100 items being transferred and only transferred the 10 that you wanted, right? And it kind of matters once you're going to the 50th page, but you know. Yeah. I mean, somebody might just look at those page numbers and click right in the middle to see, let me see what's there, but that could be havoc for the database in behind. But yeah. not, not so with Yugabyte. You can click on any page number. So. Perfect, cool. So one of the things I, I just wanted to admit that I was surprised is seeing a JSONB data type inside Yugabyte because this doesn't exist in Cassandra. So at one point where if JSON is given to me, I kind of do queries that were similar in the MongoDB document-oriented world, right? That is, I can start adding these orders itself, or take the books as an example here, start adding a bunch of these columns inside the JSON itself, and it actually gives me an ability to query inside these columns as well. That means I can say, inside the books, I want all the books done by author Stephen Hawking's. Like right from, right from here itself in the JSON. So, Karthik, question for you is, can you expand on how exactly you wanted to put JSON inside Gigabyte, and what were the trade-offs you had to do? 
Yeah, Thank yeah, you. that's a that's a very very good question. So, uh, firstly, as far as how, right? Like, uh, recall that at the core of of Yugabyte is DocDB, which is a document oriented database. So, it was relatively easy for us and more natural for us to to encapsulate JSON at the core level. So, even if you simply take a row that has five columns, it's written as a document which has a primary key and five key values or attributes inside, the, inside that key, right? So that's how Yugabyte does it anyway. Whether it's a row, whether it's a Redis hash map, whether it's a Cassandra like thing, or whether it's a Postgres you know, RDBMS table, everything is a document internally, right? So it was just like fitting and natural that we exposed the power of documents in some way. Now, one of the issues we had heard over and over again, and, and we naturally sympathize with this issue being developers ourselves at, at Yugabyte, is that you have Cassandra, which is excellent for event data. Right? So it does like IoT style, stock ticker style, order history, all of these really well. You have Mongo, which is very good at flexible schema. What you really want is a database that can do event data with flexible schema. Yeah. Because many a times you don't know the attributes coming from your different devices. Your devices may be changed on the fly to put two more metrics and send them back. And you don't want to have to change your schema ahead of time and make sure that the table is ready. So that was the motivation for incorporating it. Now as far as the trade-offs, Documents always come with trade-offs. There is a write optimization and a read optimization that is possible. Uh, we believe that the Cassandra model itself allows for a lot of write optimization. So for the specific document data type, that's a JSON-B data type, we decided to make it read optimized, which is closer to what Postgres does. It's just much easier to like, wrap the head around, but write optimizing this type is also something we intend to do in future. Cool. We are compacting all the time. Great question. We learned our lesson at 3 a.m. or many 3 a.m. on-call like debugging sessions at Facebook. So we have a lot of IP to reduce the impact of compaction on a running system. So uh, we actually did benchmarks where we ran heavy workloads and measured P99.9 .9 and 99.99 with with the Netflix data benchmark, so ND bench, and we were able to make sure that our impact of compactions on running foreground queries is, is very minimal. So if you're, our P99.99 was around 10 or 20 milliseconds, so it's, it's really, really low. And we do that by splitting compactions into a large queue, small queue, multi-threading, and scheduling compactions. So we do a lot of stuff to make sure that doesn't bite us. Right. Uh, not yet. Uh, the question is, do we support full text searching? Full text searching is in the roadmap. It's one of the index types is how we like to view it. Uh, we haven't done a full text index yet, but that's definitely in the roadmap. So it's one of those things. The other way we view this world is also to do change data capture. So to let people take this, take the data out or the set of changes out and apply it into an elastic like system. So you get even more than just plain basic search. Yes, that is our aim. Our, uh, thank you for saying it. I don't, it won't look as good if I said it, but yeah. <laughs> but yes, our, our aim is that like a lot of people are stuck in Oracle and want to move to a cloud native way, whether it's a public cloud, containers, et cetera. And we feel that existing databases don't exactly give options with respect to things like indexes, transactions, unique constraints, um, like a JSON data type, like, or a Spark. Like you need a lot of things to build a modern app. And we believe that people aren't simply taking those apps and moving them into the cloud on top of something like a Yugabyte. People actually want to transform those apps to run in a cloud native fashion. And, and that's what we're targeting, actually. That is actually one of our bread and butter things. So it, hence the OLTP focus, the transactional focus. Of, of the database. Thank you for okay. that. Yeah. <laughs> so, Karthik, as a Cassandra veteran, I have a question for you. And yeah. thanks to you for bringing up compaction. So, whenever Cassandra would go and trigger a minor compaction, my query performance would drastically slow down. That's right. Obviously, major compaction was a strict no no Don't even do for it, the yeah. industry. Yeah. So, one of the things that I think we forgot to mention in the talk was we have Cassandra API and Redis API. What actually is the Yugabyte core written in? What language of choice do yes, you use? Yes, I think that's a great, thank you for bringing that up. Yugabyte is written all in C++ from ground up. Um, few reasons for that. I mean, I see a lot of people smiling already, but yeah, <laughs> few, few, few reasons for that. Firstly, uh, Cassandra and HBase, like having worked on both these products intimately myself, like were built on, in the disk days, like, SSD was not even a thing when these things were built. So if, and we did a lot of analysis, and, and the type of machines you had, the amount of memory you had per machine wasn't a whole lot. Like you typically have no more than you know, 30, 40, 50 gigs of RAM. That's about the limit, and it's all disk-based systems. So in that setup, 
you can get by with a lot of tuning without GC hitting you. Uh, but if you f fast forward to today, you have uh, SSDs, NVMe, like 60 gigs of RAM is like, you know, it's, I could do it with a USB drive now. So it's, it's available all over the place. So in all of these scenarios, like, you will find that GC does catch up with you. So that is also true when you're running compactions. That is true when you have a lot of updates, deletes, et cetera. So what you find is that what we thought of is that it would have cut our time a lot to build the database in Java because we were very familiar with both Cassandra and HBase, and we could take a lot and rebuild. But we thought we just should do it the right way. And so it's all C++ based. We actually have. POCs where people have installed us with like 64 cores and 200 gigs of RAM. So these are like not uncommon deployments now. And, and so it becomes extremely important to manage memory and disk and, and the interaction really, really carefully. So when you talk about the second thing about people really trying to build the modern database, right? You have all of these legacy, yeah. like we're the new guy, right? So really what I would consider to be the new guy would be your support for user defined functions, tool libraries. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So, the like I would I would say the vision versus the current state is is obviously we want to get there. The fact that we can build it, but we don't have it, doesn't necessarily tell on us not being able to do it. So that's just like want to put the disclaimer out. Uh, we are somewhat customer driven, so it really depends on what kind of requests we get from customers, and that's how we build features. Uh, specifically to CUDA, we have had a few, and like GPU based integrations, like we've had a few uh, discussions with a lot of customers. That typically comes up in analytic databases. We are mostly in the what you would call OLTP and HTAP. So it's analytics for the purpose of real time. Sure. So uh, user personalization in this particular example. Like a user personalization tells you when you come in, what should I buy, right? And that has to happen instantly, right? It, it, it doesn't matter if you're giving me more accurate data later or you had to analyze less or more. So we haven't come across the GPU requirement yet. Like GPU is expensive and it makes sense when you have a lot of data that you have to analyze quickly. And this is more true of analytic or OLAP databases. We're strictly on the OLTP HTAP side. So we haven't done it. it our, our core allows us to do that, but we haven't done that yet. So you're, you're aware of the right yeah. GPU-based There are GPU-based. Yes. 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 We're closer to the Cockroach DB side, not so much to the Connectica side. Like Cockroach DB will be OLTP. Um, the difference is, like, I think Connectica, uh, their aim, if I were to paraphrase, I don't really know their aim, but I'm just saying at a high level what I understood of their product. They're trying to get you to analyze a lot of data really quickly. Right? And that is more of an OLAP work, workflow where you have petabytes of data. You want to really crunch it quickly and get, get out analytics. And making it SQL compatible just makes it that much easier to express what you want to analyze. Uh, CockroachDB, their aim is OLTP, much closer to what we're doing. Uh, but their mission is to do scale out SQL because they believe single node SQL is really limiting. We want to scale that out. Our mission is to simplify modern applications. So we believe you need SQL and NoSQL. You can't just do it with SQL. So if you took a Cockroach DB, you would still need a NoSQL database for scale, and you would need a cache for low latency serving. The complexity of the app at that point is still as high. You've taken out one piece where you need to scale out the, the SQL part. Our vision is, why don't we just make app development simple? Because the modern days, when people get into pain, they often cross the bridge from SQL to NoSQL looking for solutions to deal with scale, right? And so we're just offering that in a single uh, platform. No, 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 yeah. it's, it's great, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think we're actually, that is one of the aims of Yugabyte. Like, different microservices try to achieve different ends. And, and we believe that the API is the key to achieving those ends. 
but the data underlying data layer being so fragmented and different forces you to do a lot more work. Like in this example, we talked about a Redis API for very dynamic content and a Cassandra API for transactional content, right? Now, if your data layer is completely different, you need to figure out where to put that Redis data. If Redis fails, how do you repopulate it? If you want to scale out, what do you do there? So 80% of your microservices design is now focusing on this and not so much on what did I really want to do with that microservice? What, what was the business logic I wanted to accomplish? Like that kind of takes a 10%, 20% backseat, and 80% is like, yeah, this is Redis. Redis does sorted sets. That's great. If I don't have it, I have to write an app server that emulates sorted sets. But if Redis dies, I need to repopulate it. But then I have to shard. Like, all of this stuff gets in the way, right? So we've gone through many conversations with customers. And so where that seems to be the problem, in fact, their weekly discussions rotate around whether to put another piece of data in Redis or leave it in Cassandra or not build the feature. And it's not about whether the feature is useful, right? So that, that takes a backseat, right? So that's right. really what we're trying to target. Right. So we have about five minutes on the clock, so let's get yeah, through the code question, design. Yeah. Uh, so next up was TTL. Won't spend more, more, much more time on this, but TTL is what offered us to go and do sales and coupons and things like that. Like which product should expire quickly with like you know 20% off, 30% off, things like that. So it's not live on the app itself yet, but the backend exists. So you cannot do Thanksgiving sale right now on our site. Uh, the next step was, how did we come up with the recommendations and the ratings and the user reviews itself and a bunch of NLP stuff that we, we tried to do? Simple, simple architecture, Yugabyte deployed on PKS, Spark itself gets deployed on PKS, and Spark, Kubernetes Master integrates with Spark Scheduler to go and deploy these jobs at an elastic scale. That is, depending on the data set itself you're touching, what your query is touching, at one point, the pods will spin up, do the processing, dump the data back into the Yugabytes derived tables, kill itself. So pretty simple. We have some examples on uh, PKS Spark website itself that you can go and hit. Last one was straight up that UT asked, how does Spring Cloud Dataflow help us? So it's an S3 source and a Cassandra sync. Bunch of small data processing we did, especially with the timestamp and removing uh, escape characters. In the reviews, people write kind of bad language, so we had to get rid of a bunch of things like that and escape characters, and then write to Yugabyte Direct. Uh, Yugabyte console, uh, we didn't get a lot of time to spend on day two, but Yugabyte console itself that we saw got, getting deployed on PKS is what helps us with day two automation. That is Yugabyte and Yugab, it's Yugabyte universe itself, all your day two operations in some terms of backup, restore, alerts, health checks, Prometheus monitoring was taken care of for us. And the best part, you can do a rolling upgrade of a live database in canaries without having a downtime to your applications. That was something the most highlighting feature for us to work with Yugabyte team and getting this database on top of PKS. So. Now, we'll just quickly switch gears. We have five minutes on the clock. We started 11.55, so I'm keep a time, keeping a time check. Uh, it's important. <laughs> yes. So we just want to highlight on a quick few real-world use cases that Yugabyte is currently used in. And this is not on PKS. It's outside of PKS, uh, the realm, for the next three slides. And how exactly a few companies in financial industry and a blockchain industry is using Yugabyte today. And Karthi is going to quickly touch upon how do you go and deploy a multi-hybrid cloud topology cluster? That is, you can have two sets of nodes in AWS, one in Google Cloud. How do they form a cluster, the raft consistency, and things like that? So whatever you can accomplish, Karthik, no pressure in five yeah, minutes. I can just like, do the demo, so it's fine. Okay. Yeah. okay. So uh, this is a deployment of, uh, of Yugaware. Uh, on on bear, on VMs like you know on on just clouds like just wanted to show the multi data center aspect because we are working through the Kubernetes side of things to get multiple Kubernetes clusters to talk to each other which as you guys know is not is non trivial with Kubernetes so yeah. it's it still shouldn't stop us from doing a global deployment right so so first off this this application is uh, configured to run and this is something that uh, you know you would run on in your IaaS in your account so it's not a managed service although it feels like one um, you. You would come in and plug in with all of the AWS credentials so that it manages your AWS uh, regions. Uh, and with a, bu a bunch of GCP 
uh, like this example has AWS, it has GCP, multi-region GCP, and it has an on-premise data center. So all of these things deployed simultaneously. Uh, without going into too many details about how to set this up, I just wanted to show a couple of applications. The first one is a globally distributed cluster. I think there were some questions about latencies and how it, it really works. So uh, this is an example of a simple user identity. So users logging in, viewing their profile, changing their password, changing their profile. So simple reads and writes. So it's single key value reads and writes. But you can imagine distributed writes are no different. It just takes slightly longer latency because you have to now update multiple keys, right? So, so this is a a cluster that's deployed on US Central, US East, and Europe. So it's a globally consistent ring. Uh, it's got five nodes, as you can see at the top left. It's got five nodes and a replication factor of five. Um, and this setup can simultaneously run Yugabyte uh, like Cassandra and Redis, which is already running that, and uh, Postgres will come up pretty soon. So independent of the API you talk, this is the deployment topology that we have built for this API. Uh, in fact, for Redis, we actually support building multiple Redis tables. So unlike like traditional Redis where it has one table, like sure. we, we just expanded it to have multiple databases so you can have your data, instead of being mixed in the same Redis cluster, you can actually isolate it. Now, the node management is done for you by uh, YougoWare. So it spins up nodes on your behalf, gets them networked. If it can go all the way to doing uh, VPCs and security groups and to make it like a touch-free install, or you can provide a lot of those based on external orchestration and, and YougoWare will just use those values. Now, this is a, a running workload, so I wanted to show what's running here. Uh, so this has writes going on globally. Uh, it's doing about a little less than 10,000 reads and about 50 writes. Those writes are very expensive because they go far away across the world and we didn't want to pay AWS too much money, so write volume is low. So this is more of a deployment topology example, more so than a, a, a throughput example, right? And we have really good throughput, but it would cost also. So um, if you look at the latencies, though, you have 41 milliseconds because two of the copies are in US Central. Two copies of data are in US East, and one copy of the data is in Europe, which means most of the writes originating from US would only take 40 milliseconds to find quorum. You need, so two, two, and one, you need to write to three guys, which is a majority, so you'd find that quorum pretty quickly. Latency from uh, Europe would be higher, write latencies, obviously, because they have to travel to Europe to find, for, to US to find quorum, but write latencies from the US are relatively lower, but they're still pretty high. They're at the 40 millisecond range. Uh, but reads are at the 200 microsecond range because each read happening from every data center is going local. So Europe reads from Europe, US reads from US Central and West. So it's a 200 microsecond latency for reads. Um, Cool. And, and, you can, and I wanted to show the other setup, which is a multi-cloud uh, setup. So you have, uh, this is a read replica example. Reads and writes going on in US West, happening in uh, Google Cloud, and only reads going on from a read replica in US East on AWS. Right, so you can do on-prem, cloud, whatever you want. I'm gonna jump right into the metrics here. Uh, now you have, Reads and writes going on from US West, we said. So 20,000 reads and about 300 writes or, or whatever writes going on from, uh, and 20,000 reads across US East and West, and 300 writes going on from US West alone. Yep. Now the write latency is 1.6 milliseconds because it's just happening in one multi-zone deployment on US West alone. So you got very low write latency. And the read latencies are like, you know, a little under 200 microseconds, so same ballpark, but they're happening from both data centers, US East and West. So these are things you can already deploy today. Uh, like IoT, you may be okay with asynchronous replication because you want, us, you want your writes to be really fast. For something like the device profile or the user profile or something related to security, you may want globally distributed setup. So you can do both and really get your deployment out of the way really quickly. So something that would take, like we believe, many, many months, like nine months to a year to stand up in production, it, it, for us it just takes a few minutes, like 10 to 15 minutes to stand up. With all the metric monitoring, like uh, we have a ton of metric monitoring, we have the ability to do backups integrated with S3 and NFS, and uh, you, if you wanted to, for example, change this cluster, uh, from you, all you'd need to do is go ahead and change the instance type, and the system internally does rolling upgrades and you know, brings in a new instance type, removes the old one, so all of that stuff is automated for you. Cool. I think, I think we are up on time, so yeah. just one, one quick mention when Karthik is switching the slides. You can actually use the service broker today to go deploy outside of PKS as well. So, if you have PKS deployed on your PCF platform, obviously that's a choice of runtime that you would choose. 
But if at all you have directly Google Cloud or AWS or Azure credentials, you can directly go and deploy the clusters right from your Apps Manager marketplace. Uh, can we? Yeah, we can skip all this. Yeah, yeah we, because we'll send out a deck. So, yeah. uh, quick thing. Looking forward, as Karthik mentioned before, the multi-site capabilities with Kubernetes itself, not specifically to PKS. In general, Kubernetes, we are collaborating with the special interest group. It's called Cube's, uh, Cube Fed Sig. And we're actively participating in discussions where how do we go and get TCP connectivity across these nodes because you just cannot go, go through load balancer because gigabytes and databases like gigabyte would need thorough connectivity across the nodes. So things like that are happening. Uh, you can join the SIG channel where all these active discussions are happening again. Spring Data gigabyte, as UT asked the question, uh, it's happening, it's incubating right now. We listed out things of Spring Cassandra, and Spring Data Cassandra, Spring Data Redis, and things like that. Distributed Postgres SQL is better right now, and you want to be GAing in next. It's, it's yeah, we're working towards GA. If there's any specific use cases you guys have in mind, we like we expect you to have a wide functional coverage in the next four months or so. But if you have a subset, if you have an actual app, we'd love to partner with you guys. Yeah. Um, and on Jepson tests, we actually have a clean running Jepson suite. We have a blog post about it. Please feel free blog.yugabyte.com. But yeah. we're working with official Jepson AFIRE to get this certified by him. But this, it's the same suite. It's open source. We've run yeah. it. Um, performance testing and node density benchmarks. We have a lot of those, but we want to build those for Kubernetes because of the first question that many people ask is, how does it perform in Kubernetes? What happens when a node dies in Kubernetes? And, and so on and so forth. So it's really about maturing Kubernetes for data workloads. So that's something that's in progress, but we we have a lot of this material for VMs and bare metal available already. Correct. And the last thing I wanted to uh, leave out there is if you go to yugabyte.com slash pivotal, you'll see all these things happening, all the PKS related work that our teams have been doing. It's all listed out there in blog posts and videos and stuff. So I think we are up time, so we can do discussions right after the talk. Yeah. Thanks, guys.